The Cat Out of the Bag, containing the whole secrets and mysteries of Freemasonry never before divulged. In addition to the secrets of an entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason, those of a royal arch and knight templar, are fully disclosed, together with scriptural and other reasons for the forms of initiation. Also an appendix containing two Masonic songs and the secrets of Druidism, never before published. The whole illustrated with appropriate engravings. By Brothers Runt and Pitcher, Master Masons and Knight Templars. Runt. As you are now, Brother Pitcher, within the walls of this just, lawful, and warranted lodge, I have to inform you, that to you there is no retreating until I have initiated you into all the mysteries of the first degree of ancient Freemasonry. Masonry is a science, containing many valuable secrets, which have been hailed with rapture by the most enlightened men of every age and nation, kings, princes, and the potentates of the earth have received its mysteries, and thought it no degradation to change the scepter for the trowel. Previous to your being initiated into the mysteries of Freemasonry, it is my duty to inform you that you must enter into a solemn obligation to keep sacred and inviolable all the secrets of our order, after which, I shall proceed to instruct you in those hidden branches of science which have remained unknown, but to Masons, from the foundation of the world, at the same time, I must inform you, that justice, honor, and mercy are the principal characteristics of our order. And should you never disgrace Freemasonry, Freemasonry will never disgrace you. The first step in Masonry, figure I plate one. Runt. You will have the goodness, brother Pitcher, to strip stark naked, like our first parents in paradise, and, with the square in one hand and the compasses in the other, approach to me as a mason, that is place your one leg at right angles to the other, with your arms extended, holding the square and compasses, and spin yourself three times round upon your left heel, keeping your body perfectly erect, having stood motionless for three minutes, you will please to hop three times round the room, and three times over a stool, with your arms and legs in the same position, and repeating three times the words, stultus hocus pocus, Pocus Pocus Stultus. On uttering these mystical words, the peals of thunder begin to roll, and flashes of lightning are seen to dart at a distance, from behind the curtain the hideous form of his satiric majesty, dignified with orass and cloven feet, utters hollow groans, to the terror and astonishment of the trembling candidate, who, at this crisis, affords considerable sport to the waggish part of the already initiated. To comply with the forms of antiquity, prevalent in our order, you must now, Brother Pitcher, patiently submit to the operation of the scalping knife, like the male children of the Jews, eight days after birth, to prevent the effusion of human blood, your wounds shall be seared three times with the salamander, or lodge poker, carefully heated to a high temperature, after which, you may be pronounced duly initiated. This last part of the ceremony being of a delicate and dangerous nature, it is generally performed by a son of Esculapius. Should there be one present, otherwise the master must operate with the best of his skill. Envy the above, brother Pitcher, is a sound reason why females are excluded from participating in our Masonic mysteries. Runt. Having gone thus far through the ceremony of your initiation, I have now to inform you, brother Pitcher, that there are different degrees in Freemasonry, kept separate and apart from each other, and that there are secrets peculiar to each degree, the sign of an entered apprentice is performed by drawing the little finger of the left hand across the mouth, and the word is Shadrach, which shall be hereafter explained to you, suffice it to say, that it is a word highly prized among masons as a guard to their privileges, therefore, too much caution cannot be used in communicating it, and before you can be admitted into any lodge you must repeat the word Shadrach three times at the door, and place yourself exactly in the first position, and the master, upon hearing the word Shadrach, will leave his chair and admit in due form. Runt. I must now, brother Pitcher, explain to you a few of the reasons why we masons are attached to the number three, and for which it has always been held sacred by the craft, many of which prove the high antiquity of our order. Reasons. Because it is an odd number, consisting of a beginning, a middle, and an end. In masonry it represents the three different degrees, viz. An entered apprentice, a fellow craft, and a master mason, it also represents the principal officers, the master and his two wardens. The number three represents the three stages of life viz. youth, manhood, and old age. There were three grand architects at the building of Solomon Temple. His satanic majesty has three names, viz. the devil, Satan, and Beelzebub, 
He is sometimes also denominated the old gentleman, Nick, and Clutey. In conversation there are three things, the person speaking, the person spoken to, and the person or thing spoken of. In a phrase are three things, the subject, the attribute, and the object. Among the Jews the priests, sprinkled the altar three times previous to the sacrifice. The Sabians prayed three times a day. In the Salian dance they beat the ground three times with the feet. Mythological reasons. Runt. We Masons, Brother Pitcher, are attached to the number three for the following mythological reasons, from which we claim great antiquity. Jupiter's thunderbolt had three forks. Neptune's trident had three prongs Pluto's dog. Cerberus, vile brute, had three heads. There were three furies, three Paco, three graces, and three times three or nine muses. The Pythian priestess sat upon a tripod, the three legs of which denoted a knowledge of the past, the present, and the future. These are all solid and rational reasons, brother Pitcher, that you should jump three times over a stool, as every other brother and fellow has done before you. The Entered Apprentice Parting song by Brother Runt. Tane Jonti Hazar, or the Kinigad Slaskas. 1. A mason's a fellow. That likes to be mellow. He'll push round the bottle. And drink till it's done. We oft meet together. In all kinds of weather. To handle the trowel. And relish the fun. 2. The maids of the village. And farmer, from tillage. Oft talk of the mystic. And wish for to know but all are small matter. We manage much better, than to the wide world, unpaid for to go. 3. The jewel and collar, sometimes on the scholar, make things have the color, of something profound, a ball or procession, oft makes an impression, and brings an apprentice, hard fast to be bound. 4. In the hour of vexation, we join in libation, with Venus and Bacchus, we swagger till day, the money we'll borrow, to drown or kill sorrow, like Bebo, we tipple, and moisten our clay. 5. When the cash is expended, our frolics quite ended, we join hands together, and then march away, we'll hunt for another, and call him dear brother, because for the grog, and the liquor he'll pay. The second step in masonry, Figure 2. Plate 1. Runt. This step, brother Pitcher, is much superior to the former, but nothing to that which you shall hereafter be instructed in, you. Must strip stark naked, like your grandmother, Eve, with only an apron, and, as before, keep your body perfectly erect and place your left leg at right angles to your right, holding in your hands the sun and moon with the seven stars over your head, indicating your immortality you will next spin yourself five times round upon your heel without letting down your right leg, then remain motionless for the space of five minutes, after which you must hop five times round the room, and jump five times over a stool, repeating the memorable words in hoc signo vinco, for the following sound reasons, first, because five percent is the legal interest of money, second, because there are five noble orders of architecture the Corinthian, the Composite, the Tuscan, the Ionic, and the Doric. Third. Because we have five natural senses seeing, hearing, smelling, feeling, and taste, with many other sound reasons hereafter to be instructed in. The word of a fellow craft mason is Meshek or Meshek, which shall be hereafter explained when you are admitted into the third degree. Repeat it aloud, for the benefit of the brethren, and remember, that it is a word highly prized among masons, therefore, too much caution cannot be used in keeping it, you must strictly observe never to repeat it even to yourself, excepting in the presence of five or more fellow craft masons or brother Meshechs. And the sign is, to draw your little finger adroitly along your chin. The third step in masonry, fig. 3. Plate 1. Runt. I shall now, brother Pitcher, proceed to initiate you into all the mysteries of the third degree of Freemasonry. It is much superior to the two former and consequently of much greater importance. Being reduced to a state of nudity, with the exception of Arnapron, you will have the goodness, first, to cross the one leg at right angles to the other, because all straight lines, right angles and perpendiculars, are true and proper signs in Masonry. You must next clench your hands over your head, and stand seven minutes in that position, 
then hop seven times round the room, keeping your arms and legs as directed, and when the hot poker is seven times applied to your posterior parts, leap seven times over a stool, and each time repeat the words mecum hocus pocus hocus pocus mecum, and prostrate yourself seven times before the chair after the manner of eastern countries, repeating the words O stultissim abdallah. Having undergone this arduous duty, you may retire and be invested with your personal comforts, that is, clothe yourself, and, on your returning, you shall be exalted above your fellows, that is, placed upon a high bench, and the brethren will join hands, and dance seven times round you, repeating incessantly the words tecum hocus pocus, hocus pocus tecum. You will then be permitted to sit, like another Christian, for the remaining part of the evening, and allowed to drink grog, smoke a pipe, and be laughed at by every brute present. The sign of a master mason is to snap your second finger with your thumb seven times. The word is Abednego, repeat it aloud, for the benefit of the brethren. I have now to congratulate you, brother Abednego, in being admitted into the mysteries of the third degree, it is much superior to the two former, but nothing to that of a royal archmason, there lies the grand secret, brother Pitcher. I must now, however, explain to you the full Masonic force and meaning of the three distinct words, Shadrach, Meshech and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar, one of the kings of Babylon, set up a golden image as an idol, and commanded every subject in his dominions, that when they heard the sound of certain music, that they should fall down and worship the golden image which he had set up, and such as fell not down should be immediately cast into a burning fiery furnace. We find that three devout men, Shadrach, Meshech and Abednego, were worshippers of the true God, and refused to obey this mandate, and rather than worship any idol, chose to be cast into the furnace, assuring the king that the God whom they served was able to deliver them from the power of the fire, which was heated on this occasion seven times hotter than it was wont to be heated they were accordingly bound hand and foot, and cast into the furnaces and the king, at a distance. Observed four men walking loose in the midst of the fire, and he commanded that they should be brought forth, and found that not a hair of their heads was singed, nor had the fire any power over them. Then was Nebuchadnezzar converted, and gave the most rigid commands that the worship of the true God should be set up in his kingdom, and idolatry was abolished throughout the empire. The salamander, or hot poker, was therefore applied, not that you might jump and amuse the brethren, as has been sometimes imagined, but as a test of your fortitude, and I now give it you in strict charge, rather to suffer your tongue to be torn from its root, and given to the vultures as a prey, nay, rather suffer your body to be sawn asunder and cast into the fiery furnace, or to the wild beast of the desert, than, at any time, to divulge any of your Masonic secrets. Runt. Brother Pitcher, why did you jump seven times over a stool? Pitcher. Why, Brother Runt, more for the amusement than the instruction of the brethren. Runt. There are many sound and valuable reasons, Brother Pitcher, a few of which I shall endeavor to enumerate because in astrology the number seven comprehends the primary numerical triangle, or trine and conjunctions, considered by the favorers of planetary influence as of the most benign aspect. The great architect of the universe rested the seventh day, having finished the work of creation. There were seven primary Christian churches in Asia. There were seven golden candlesticks in Solomon's temple. In the tabernacle were seven lamps. The seventh year among the Jews was commanded to be kept as a Sabbath of rest, the land lay fallow, and every seventh year all bondmen were set free. Every seventh year the law, was commanded to be read to the people. Old Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and seven years for Leah. Nebuchadnezzar was seven years a brute beast. The fiery furnace was heated seven times hotter than it was wont, in order to consume, if possible, Shadrach, Meshech, and Abednego. They were, under the Mosaic dispensation, to succor an offending brother seven times, but under the Christian dispensation, seventy times seven times. At the destruction of Jericho, seven priests, bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns, encompassed the city seven days, and on the last went seven times round its walls, and they fell at the sound of the said ram's horns. Job's friends sat condoling him seven days and nights, and offered seven bullocks and seven rams as an atonement for their wickedness. King Solomon was seven years in finishing the temple at Jerusalem. There is a book, mentioned in the Revelations, with seven seals. The child of the Shunammite sneezed seven times after it was dead, when raised by the prophet Elisha. There is a beast represented in the Revelation as a monster with seven heads. There are seven days in the week, 
and lastly out of Mary Magdalene were cast seven devils. These are antique reasons, with many others, too tedious to enumerate, and convincing proofs, that you did right, brother picture, in jumping seven times over that stool, as every other brother and fellow has done before you. Royal Arch Masonry. Runt. In my last instructions, brother picture, relative to a master mason, I gave you to understand that further valuable information should be communicated to you, when you become a royal arch mason, indeed, I assured you, that the essence of masonry lies there concealed, it is, therefore, now my duty to initiate you immediately, according to the ancient rules and established customs of our order. Runt. Though many things, rather picture, in the three former degrees, may in themselves appear trivial, nay, absurd in the extreme, yet custom in a short time reconciles them, and we become as fond of those trifles as if they possessed something of real worth. You will see even the philosopher equipped with his white apron, as pleased as if engaged in something solemn, and when promoted to a blue collar and jewel, considers himself elevated to the highest pitch of human grandeur, and, brother picture, if you should be a little disappointed on the present occasion, I know your good sense and penetration into the real secret will readily overlook it. You are well aware that in all orders and distinctions among men, there must be some stimulus given, and if we masons, brother pitcher, were not to boy up an entered apprentice with the hope of a future secret, there would be few indeed, who would pay the fees for royal archmasonry, and we all know that money is the mainstay of our order, money, brother pitcher, speaks all languages, it is the grand cement of every order, in it alone are the sinews of war, and without it the social order of things would be reversed, without money, brother, picture, the most brilliant talents have no luster, and with it the braying of an ass is accounted sweet music, I trust, brother, picture, you will not in any way consider me personal, look at different opulent individuals in our own town, who are looked up to as the standard of true wisdom, divest them of their money, and they would sink in importance below the meanest mechanic. In our order, brother picture, it is absolutely necessary to be expert with the salamander, and to be profoundly acquainted with all the cant phrases of the craft, so as to be able to keep up a plausible story, in order to divest the mind of the candidate from the faculty of reflection, for should be ever, by any unlucky accident, attempt to put it to the test of common sense, before he passes the arch, our funds would suffer, and the whole fabric would soon dwindle to nothing. But now to return to the subject matter in hand. You must again strip stark naked, with the exception of an apron, and hobble all fours seven times round the room, that is, walk upon your hands and feet, representing our grand progenitor, Nebuchadnezzar, who, as I before observed, was driven from among men, as you are this day, and his dwelling was with the beast of the field, and he did eat grass like an ox, his body was wet with the dew of heaven, his hair became like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws, and a man's heart was taken from him, and a beast's heart was given him, and he was in this sad condition for seven years, till his reason returned to him, when he was shorn, washed, and anointed king, and his counsellors and lords sought after him, so that he was restored to his former greatness, with a due sense of his duty to the only true God. Thus, in addition to an apron, you are furnished with a feather cap, to represent the eagle's feathers, and a pair of gloves, with horn points, to represent bird's claws, you are then sprinkled over seven times with rain water, and a little grass being placed before you, you are compelled to eat. You must express your gratitude to the brethren, who have condescended to raise you from among the swinish multitude, or beasts of the field, with whom you have herded for the former part of your life, and placed you among an exalted race of beings with Zerubbabel, Haggai, and Nathan in point of importance. You are then compelled to sit cross-legged, after the manner of eastern countries, for seven minutes, then one of the chiefs, denominated Beelzebub, conducts you through an arch, with a chain round your leg, and hails you king of Babylon. Then the leading men of the city do you homage, informing you, that you are no longer a brute beast, that you are now an exalted individual among nations, a king of the most famous city Babylon. Hail, King Nebuchadnezzar, seven times. Then the poor devil, whoever he may be, is quite amazed, and sometimes enraptured with this metamorphosis, and some illiterate beings have been of little use to their families for weeks, after being crammed in this manner, even in their sleep, exclaiming I am now no longer a beast, I am a king to the no small amusement of all around them. It is recorded that one poor industrious individual became so riveted to the belief of his being a king, that he forsook his wonted avocations, became actually stark mad, and could never afterwards be kept quiet, 
but when equipped with the feather cap and the horn-pointed gloves, and running all fours, forgetting that he was no longer a beast. After all this torn foolery, you are gravely told that the word of a royal archmason is Nebuchadnezzar, and that it is a word highly prized among archmasons, as a guard to their privileges, therefore, too much caution cannot be used in communicating it, remember, it must never be repeated, even by yourself, but in the presence of seven chiefs or Nebuchadnezzars, and then you must be all equipped as before described. In being admitted into a chapter, you must cross your legs as in the third degree, knock seven times at the door, and repeat, seven times, the words, O Nebuchadnezzar, live for ever. Then the presiding king, solemnly, and with a long face, exclaims, Let brother Nebuchadnezzar be admitted in due for me. Then, in the third position, and with your hands crossed behind your back, you must judge your distance from the door to the chair, and take seven leaps then bowing respectfully to the king, you will be permitted to sit down, but recollect, should you not take your distance so as to leap it exactly at seven times, you must repeat the doze till it operates. A Royal Arch Parting Song, by Brother Pitcher. Tune Velen's Bower. 1. When a mason I became, for to raise my deeds of fame, I got quite drunk with grog. At our parting, oh! With a twenty-four inch gauge, they quite put me in a rage. Till I swore was all my eye. And Betty Martin, oh! Chorus. With a twenty-four inch gauge, too. When my apprenticeship was done, I oft went to share the fun. And whilst the secret truths were imparting, oh! With a level, square and plumb, they tried me still to hum. But I saw was all my eye. And Betty Martin, oh! Chorus. With a level, square and plumb, three. When a master I was raised, as the thing was highly praised, I thought it might be something. On sweethearting, oh! But if Solomon had sense, he must show it somewhere hence. For in this it's all my eye. And Betty Martin, oh! Chorus. But if Solomon had sense. 4. When a royal arch you're made, with a crowbar, pick and spade, you'll still no wiser be, than at starting O. Oh, they'll place you on a stool, and dance round you like a fool, thus the secret's all my eye, and Betty Martin O. Oh. Chorus. They'll place you on a stool. Knight Templar. Runt. The next thing, Brother Pitcher, is a Knight Templar, which of itself, may be said to be no degree in Freemasonry, but as most royal archmasons wish to be in an encampment, it is now my duty, Brother Pitcher, to let you into that secret also. In the first place you must dance to the tune of five pounds five shillings, recollect, money is the grand cement of every order. This being handed over to the proper quarter, all the members repair to the lodge room, and arrange themselves in the form of a camp, and the king of the party, as there must always be a cock to a dunghill, after a long silence, exclaims, who will go up with me to Ramoth Gilead to battle. When they all with one simultaneous voice exclaim, we will go up with thee, O king, to Ramoth Gilead. Then the secretary informs them that a candidate has been duly proposed, balloted for and approved in open camp, and that it becomes those concerned to initiate him in due form. Then the candidate is stripped and dressed in ancient military uniform, with a sword, battle axe, a staff and scrip, like an antediluvian, and led into the room, when the sage King David again exclaims, Who will go up with me to Ramoth Gilead to battle? The candidate is then instructed to say, I will go up, O king. He is then furnished with a sword, and swears never to abandon King David, whenever he shall engage at Ramoth Gilead, he also swears that he will make war upon all Turks, infidels, and will show a due sense of the religion of his forefathers. The candles are then put out, and all the encampment move in procession seven times round the room, when the hoodwinked candidate is desired to halt and the lights are restored, then the hot poker or salamander is brought opposite his nose, when he is questioned as to his going up to Ramoth Gilead to battle, he is instructed to say though I were to pass through a sea of fire, yet will I go with thee, O king, to Ramoth Gilead. He is then led seven times round the room, the same questions being put, and the last time he is taught vehemently to exclaim, though I were to pass through a lake of fire and brimstone, yet I will go up with thee, O king, to Ramoth Gilead to battle. The bandage is then taken from his eyes, and a cup, not made with hands, full of wine, is given him, when he drinks success to the king and his forces at Ramoth Gilead.
He is then gravely informed that the word of a Knight Templar, is Ramoth Gilead, and to be admitted into any encampment or lodge of Templars, it is necessary to come in the antediluvian dress before described, and having repeated the words Ramoth Gilead, he gives nine distinct knocks at the door and is admitted without further ceremony, indeed, the word Ramoth Gilead is a sufficient passport, whether known personally to the brethren or not. After the ceremony, comes the hot supper, and, instead of a regular grace, the question is again put, who will go up to Ramoth? When they all, upstanding, with knives and forks held up, exclaim we are ready this day, O king, to go up with thee to Ramoth Gilead to battle. Then the battle commences, and the usual dexterity displayed would at once convince you that they would indeed pass through fire and water to gratify their appetites. After supper a song and a little grog generally concludes the battle of Ramoth Gilead. Thus are you led from one degree to another in search of a secret of real value, but about this stage of the business a full stand is generally made, and the poor devil begins either to be gulled with the apparent sociability exhibited, disgusted with its frivolosity, or enraged for the loss of money expended from time to time upon such profound nonsense, and sometimes, upon taking a retrospect view, considers it almost blasphemy to hear so many parts of scripture, twisted to a meaning which no translation can admit. Masonry may, sometimes, be of service when charity is considered as its basis, but it is, for the most, the road to low company, and an inlet to drunkenness and debauchery. Druidism. The order of Druids, like that of the Knight Templar, is no degree of Freemasonry, but it is a distinct order prevalent in Wales and in the south of England to enable you to enter a ghost, as the lodge of that denomination is termed, you must be introduced by a Druid, and in an adjoining room to the ghost you must divest yourself of your own habiliments and be equipped in a druidical toggery, viz. In a thin black serge cloak, reaching to the middle of the thigh, with holes for the arms, then with a silk cord round your neck, and without hat, shoes or stockings, you must enter the ghost, where the druids, behind the curtain, utter the most hideous yells and groans, and, by burning sulphur and other suffocating stuff, you would almost imagine yourself in his satanic majesty's dominions. Then the archdruid, or chief priest, comes forward in a menacing manner, with a druidical battle-axe, and demands the reason why you dare invade or enter his sacred domain, and threatens you with instant death in case of a refusal to depart. The conductor then holds you fast by the halter, and, with terror on his countenance, instructs the candidate to say I am not come hither, O archdruid with any hose. Tile intention, but thy servant has undertaken this journey at great expense, and humbly solicits to be initiated into the mysteries of druidism, for which ceremony he is duly prepared. The archdruid then answers in a stern manner, that none are admitted into that mystical order unless set apart for that office by the tongue of good report, and initiated under a solemn obligation to keep sacred and inviolable all the secrets of druidism. Having sworn as above, the priest takes you by the right hand, and, kneeling down with you before a druidical altar, informs you that the word of a druid is Stonehenge, and requests that you will, upon the strength of your oath, keep it sacred, never to repeat it, even if passing the place, except in a just and consecrated ghost, and there in the presence of three or more druids. You are also informed that the sign of a druid is to place your forefinger on the tip of your nose, at which sign you will be immediately recognized by all druids, but be sure never to pronounce Stonehenge, excepting there be three present, and then pronounce it in syllables Henge first and Stone afterwards, to prevent a disclosure, the priest then informs you that Stonehenge is the most ancient druidical temple, or place of worship, in the world, that it existed long before the days of Adam. That it is situated on Salisbury Plain, in the wilds of Dorsetshire, and consists of an immense number of stones of massy granite, standing erect, arranged in a semicircular form, covering nearly three acres of land, and can be seen at a great distance. Here the ancient sages of our order practiced the ceremonies, and enlightened the then credulous world with their valuable and wise instructions, and practiced those arts which are now revered with becoming reverence in every ghost throughout the world, which may we and all other druids practice till time shall be no more. May druidism flourish. After this you are led by the high priest round the ghost, and, taking each brother by the hand, you repeat the word Stonehenge three times, you may then take your place and ask what questions you please but you will receive no answer as to what the druids of antiquity taught and practiced, it is all comprised in the single but valuable word Stonehenge. Authentic History of the Ancient Druids. 
The Druids were the priests of the ancient Britons among whom they possessed great authority, and were held in the highest veneration, not only by the Britons, but by other Celtic nations. Indeed their sway was unlimited, as they were supposed to have the power of inflicting punishment, not only in this world, but in a future state. Their forms of worship are entirely lost, as they were never allowed to be written, but they are said to have instructed mankind in astronomy and other branches of philosophy, unmixed with the superstition and the barbarity of the age. The Druids were divided into three classes, the poets and heroic historians, the sacred musicians, and the prophets, and the last class was the most numerous, and strictly called, Druids, which in time, was a name common to the three classes. Females were also admitted to the priesthood, and called Druidesses. These were divided into three classes, the first lived together in retirement, and were bound by vows to perpetual virginity, and were held in great veneration from their possessing the powers of divination, prophesy, and working miracles the second class were married women, who assisted the Druids in their offices of religion, and occasionally saw their husbands, and the third class performed the menial offices about the temples. No doubt, from motives of policy, Freemasons will universally deny that the foregoing contains any of the secrets of Masonry, but, upon its being put to the test, it will be found perfectly erect, and, upon repeating any of the highly prized words, you will soon see, from a peculiar something in his manner, that he stands convicted under a true bill. End of the first number.